Uh, several years ago, uh, one of our parishioners who knows Chris Tomlin uh, invited, uh, and this is when Liz and I were fairly new here, but he, he, he called us and wanted to know if we wanted to go to George Mason to hear Chris Tomlin, and, and uh, well, some things you don't need to really pray about, right? It's just, right? It's just God's will. And so we're like, sure, you know, free tickets to Chris Tomlin. Yeah, we'll be there. And Lou Giglio was coming uh, to speak, because it was going to be awesome. So, so we showed up. Uh, and then he said, Af- uh, after you come, I, I want to let you know that uh, you can come with me behind the stage and have some private time with Chris Tomlin. Would you like to do that? Hmm, let me pray about it. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, and so we went to the concert. It was awesome. Uh, went backstage. Uh, and it's really interesting. Like, what do you talk to Chris Tomlin and Lou Giglio about behind stage after a concert? We had a heavy-duty theological discussion back then about what God's doing through his ministry around the country. It was just an awesome time. I mean, no small talk at all. We dove right into what's the Holy Spirit doing. It was amazing. But th- as, as fun as that private time was with uh, Chris and, and with Lou Giglio, uh, it, 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 was, it was not even near as awesome as the time of worship. I, I don't know if you know his songs, but I'll, I'll give you a, a brief tour. Um, good, good Father. It's moving. Um, our God. Uh, indescribable when you think about God. Uh, He's the everlasting God. That's a wonderful song. Then there's that uh, really fun song, How Can I Keep From Singing? I mean, because if you know Jesus, how can you help? Even if you can't sing in tune, it's okay. Uh, Then I love that that Love Ran Red, uh, uh, you know, CD, almost that album, but I would date myself. Uh, At the Cross. When you think about that, his love ran red at the cross to cleanse us of our sins. I mean, so many great songs. But when you think about Chris Tomlin, all the songs that he has written, how powerful they are when you, when you go to a worship service and you just know the Spirit descends on those services. Um, you have to back up about 3,000 years because there was a, a prolific songwriter long before Chris hit the planet, and his name was David. <laughs> David. Now, they didn't have a keyboard back then. They didn't have a Stratocaster no drums. And by the way, have you seen the real drums today? Praise God. Uh, yeah. Remember, I'm a former heavy metal guy. When I was younger, 1960s, 70s, this is awesome. But anyway, back to my sermon. Um, David, what was his instrument? The electric harp. No, 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 the harp, the harp. He used that harp, uh, and, and he just, he wrote all kinds of songs on that harp. In fact, when you read in the Psalter, when it says a Psalm of David, uh, that is the first verse in Hebrew, as I told you before, that he, that he wrote it. Now, we don't, we don't have the music anymore, so we don't know. Is it the key of E, key of D, how many sharps, how many flats? We don't know. But 3,000 years later, we're, st- we're still studying the inspired of God lyrics from, from King David. And, and Psalm 24 is just, in my estimation, the perfect psalm to talk about today uh, because it, it is a, a, a psalm that he wrote from his heart as, the, as Israel had a victory from God, and we don't know what the victory was. Scholars debate what it could have possibly been. We won't even jump into that because they don't know, so we certainly can't know. But there was some kind of victory for the nation. David wrote this victory song, uh, and he, he's sharing in the psalm uh, what his hope is for his people as they approach worship of God. And so the picture in your mind should be, this is before the temple was built. They're going to the tabernacle, and they're walking up the hill. They can see the tabernacle, and they're walking up the hill after a victory God gave them, and and they're going to walk into God's presence and give him worship. And as they do this, David says, let me share with you as your songwriter, as your Chris Tomlin, let me share with you my hope as your worship leader. Perfect for today, because the hope that he shares here transcends time. Because we too have had a victory, have we not? We're sitting in the middle of a victory God has given us. Because just go back in time for a little bit. The basement, which is massive. You haven't seen it yet. I mean, it's 11,000 square feet of like a giant bowling alley. It's like a whole nother church down there. Um, when they, that's what they built first. They dug that out. What used to be here? Well, there, no, there was a forest here. Remember the forest? And next to the forest was a very high, highly raised soccer field. Remember that? Yeah, that's all gone. 1,200 dump trucks drove by my office over there. Do you know how I feel about dump trucks? <laughs> beep, 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 beep. I would go home and it would be in my head for a year as 1,200 dump trucks went by my But it rained for over 70 days. It was like Noahic, remember? And so they're trying to dig this, this over here, and all of a sudden, I don't know who sent all the rain, but... It rained and rained and rained. There was one uh, afternoon when I was leaving work, uh, and one young guy drove his uh, bobcat, you know, down into the base, 
the basement to dig more. Uh, and it was Friday afternoon, and he's like, <laughs> he was, they asked him, you, you think you should move that for the weekend? Oh, no, it'd be there Monday when I come back in. Well, it was there all right, under water. <laughs> you couldn't even, you could just see, barely see the top of it. Uh, Pastor Michael sent me a picture and said, have you seen this? I mean, you couldn't drive it out because it's not a boat. It's underwater. I mean, so when you look at all the things we've gone through, we had many, many obstacles along the way, but God gave us the victory. Now you're sitting here and enjoying this. So as we come to worship, uh, and, and, and we're anticipating worship, what, what's the hope of the worship leader? Well, what's the hope of the pastor? Well, it's what David puts in this psalm. Let's think about it. Motif of the passage, in case you want to know right up front what's the main idea, because there is an authorial intent here. What's his main idea? That divine victories, i.e., like this, uh, should be met with uh, worship that's grounded in hope. Hope. What kind of hope? Well, he's going to share with you what kind of hope you should have as you come into the worship room to worship God. What's the hope of the, of the pastor for his people? Uh, that's David, the shepherd. Well, verse 1. He says, this is a psalm of David. He said, let's focus first on God's character. My hope is that you would know God's character as you come into his presence. Let's look at it this way. My hope, uh, Marty's hope, as you come into this house of worship uh, now and into the future, is that you would walk away from here knowing God deeper, better, that you would be challenged with who God is. Notice what David says. He says, it's a psalm of David, and then he begins to sing whatever the notes were back then. The earth is the Lord's and, and all of its fullness, the world and all those who dwell are, therein. For he, God, uh, has founded it upon the seas. He established it, the world, upon the waters. Boy, did he. What are the two greatest commandments in, Jesus said in all of the Bible? If you took the entire Torah, you know, the Big Ten Commandments and the 613 additional Mosaic Commandments, and you boiled all of that down, to the greatest commandments, Jesus said there are two, and we all should know them. The first commandment, the greatest commandment is what? You should love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. I mean, all you've got. Or as they would say down south, whole hog. Okay, my family's from South Carolina, all, or Southern California. Whole hog, all you've got. Uh, and then the second commandment, which we can't talk about today, which our culture desperately needs is, if I know God... Well, then I love my neighbor as I love myself. What's wrong with our country? They don't know God like they should know God, because if they did, they'd love their neighbor, whoever they were, whatever their race was. Anyway, that's another sermon for another day. What's he say? That you would be a, a people, as you approach worship, after a victory of God, who would deepen your understanding of the character of God. So I have to ask you a question. Do you study God? Do you study him? Uh, I've been studying him since I became a Christian uh, in 1967. I've been studying God. How do you study God? Well, I read the word of God, and I pay attention to God, and I'm constantly studying. And the thing about it is, the older I get, the, the sooner I know I'm going to be departing the planet, because the road starts narrow, doesn't it? I mean, knowing how long it takes me to go through a Bible book, I'm starting to look at, man, I probably couldn't do Isaiah very soon. I mean, I mean, that might take like 10 years I mean, to get into it. I mean, unbelievable. But you're constantly studying the word to know God. I'm looking at my life and analyzing things that God sends my way, the blessings, the hard things. God, what can I learn about? You're constantly knowing God. When I was younger, in my late teens, when J.I. Packer first wrote Knowing God, I thought to myself, uh, that's a, that sounds like a good read. Have you ever read it? You don't read it quickly. Uh, in fact, uh, one of our parishioners who started reading that book this week wrote and told me and said, I'm kind of wading through that book. Why? Because it's so meaty. You know, do you study God? I study God all the time. But the thing is, uh, there's not much time in a lifetime to really know the depths of him. You can only scratch the surface because he's so fathomless. So what does David say about knowing God? He says, well, let me, let me share with you what I see about God's character as I study him. He says, uh, who, who owns the earth? What does he say? The earth belongs to God. It's, a, it's the Lord's. Notice he used the word Lord with capital letters. This is different than Lord with a capital L and small letters. What's the difference? Capital L with small letters is Adonai. The, he's the Lord. He's the master. That's the, he didn't use that. He purposely, by inspiration of the Spirit of God, said, no, when I think about who owns the planet and the cosmos, it's the Lord, capital letters, L-O-R-D, capitalized. This is Yahweh, this is the divine one. This is the God of the burning bush. When Moses stood before the burning bush and, and Moses said, Lord, whom shall I say sent, sent me to them? He says, well, tell them I'm the I am. That's the L-O-R-D. 
He's the eternal one. Well, what does that mean? This is significant about the character of God. What does that mean? Well, because he's the great eternal one, he's outside of time and space. But he's, he, he's transcendent. But he's also imminent. He's with us. He's outside our dimensionality that's limited in a place of great dimensionality we cannot even comprehend. I mean, I'm sure when you see heaven, you're just going to go, whoa, unbelievable. Um, it's cause effect. We live in a cause effect world. A God is the uncaused one who caused cause effect. He started all that stuff. He's the eternal one. Jesus comes, the God of glory comes to earth. And in John 8, 58, when the, when the, when the Pharisees want to know, tell us who you are. He's very clear. Anybody that says he never claimed deity status has not read him. What he say in John 8, 58 to their question, who are you? He says, before Abraham was, I am he says, I'm the eternal God. I'm, I'm Yahweh, the covenantal God of Israel, the one who has always been and always will be, the Alpha, the Omega. David says, when I think about coming to worship of God, who's given me a victory, I think of a God who's so great that, that he, he owns everything. And if he owns everything, everything's accountable to him, and he's able to help you. He said, this God is not only that kind of God, the eternal one. He's given us a planet that, that's full of his fullness. He's given us fullness. The Hebrew word is abundance. I mean, think about abundance. If you go into a grocery store, um, what are your options when it comes to cereal? It's kind of daunting, isn't it? And you got to make sure you're following the arrows the right way, right? <laughs> How many times recently have I gone against the flow? It's like, oh my, man, they're going to probably arrest me or something, you know? Uh, but anyway, back to the sermon. You got you a lot of options, right? Like what? Cam Crunch. I love that. You don't put milk on that. You just eat it. Uh, Captain Crunch. What else have you got? Cheerios. Cheerios. Special K. Special K. Fruit Loops. Oh, I love those too. Just dry. Mm, love them. What else? Cocoa Krispies. Whoa, you have some issues with the sweet things. Uh, yeah, Cocoa Krispies. I mean, we can sit there the rest of the day and talk about all the variety. Why is that there? Because they know we love abundance. All those people making those things, love ab you love abundance. When you think about how God made the world, he made it with abundance. So when, I can only look at it as a person who loves landscaping, he didn't just give us like one kind of bush. He didn't just say, I'm going to give you uh, Texas privet bushes. That's it. Wax leaf privet. That's it. I'm giving them to you because you love to trim. There you go. Trim away. He gave us all kinds of bushes. How many trees did he give you? What are your choices? Well, uh, there's a few trees around here, aren't there? Dogwood, ash, etc. I mean, it's to infinity. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's, it's amazing. How many, uh, do you like pets? The last service, they wouldn't answer this question. Do you, they were really quiet about that one. Do you love pets? Excellent, okay. So I went to a place, uh, because God's given us abundance, and I'll, uh, let me find uh, the place. It's, it's, it's a place to go study uh, the abundance that God has given to us. Uh, it's called dogtime.com, Dog. Time.com. I went there to just look at because it said this is where you go to see how many dogs God has given us. So I went there and it's like this is kind of funny. It's alphabetized from A to Z and I start scrolling through that of all the different kinds of dogs there are. It's like what's that? There's so many dogs. It's abundance. Why? Because some people like a Great Dane and some people like a Chihuahua. Everybody's different, correct? God gives us these little creatures to love on them. They love on us. And if you tell me that they don't talk to you, think again. They do. Who gave us all that variety? God. Why? Well, because he loves you and he knows the variety is fun. Fun. I mean, David says, when I think about the character of God, even all the variety of the things that he's given us tells me about his greatness. So when you come to worship and he's given you a victory, think of a God who's blessed you with abundance. And he says he's the God who blesses people. He calls them all those who dwell on the earth. They are who he blesses and they all belong to him. Which means if God created all things and he created us and all that abundance, we are created not to just enjoy the abundance, but as we learn in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, and Solomon says, what's the chief end of man? Well, not to get involved in all the abundance, but to enjoy it and to look at it and go, this is the fingerprint of God. I must worship him. I must fear him above all things. See, David studied God, and he has these thoughts about him, and he says, you know, when I think about God's greatness, he's the one that founded the earth upon the seas. He established the, the earth upon the waters. Boy, did he. On day three, go read Genesis chapter one. On day three, God took the earth, that is 70% uh, water, and he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the tectonic plates, and I'm going to move them around by the word of my mouth, and I'm going to shape the continents. 
Uh, and I'm going I'm to bring out mountain ranges. I'm going to create valleys. And I'm going to do it on day three. And it's going to come out of the waters. And it's exactly what happened. He spoke and it was. Uh, when Liz and I were in Lake Tahoe uh, this summer with our grandchildren, um, we've been up there many, many times, uh, staying at one of our friend's uh, place uh, there. And we wanted to go to a different uh, restaurant after the grandchildren uh, uh, left and, and, and were not with us. And so we had some quiet time. And uh, so we went to a nice restaurant that we'd never been, be- been to before on a mountain. Uh, and there was an outside eating area. And it snowed the day before in June, so it was really cold. Uh, but, but we said, could we sit outside? They're looking at us like, why ever? You know, it's like the view. Because you go out there to eat, and the view was on the other side of the mountains of the Sierras, looking down into Nevada. You could see a massive valley and massive va- mountains off in the distance. And you could just sit there as a believer in God Almighty and, and just take in his majesty I'm telling you, just l- watch it. And, and, and so David says, you know, when I think about God, he's the one that made that valley and those mountains that are so majestic and speak of him. Do you study him? David says, as you come to give God thanks for the victory he's given you, might you be a person who studies him? Here's my prayer, that today and forward, that we would be people still focused on studying God. Because when you study God, it answers all life's questions. I mean, it's like a, a, the, the hub of a wheel with spokes. I mean, if you don't know God, you're, you, you have spokes tied to nothing. But when you come to know God, when you know, come to know Christ and he's your savior, he's the hub of everything, and then everything just starts to make sense, like how I'm supposed to love my wife, how I'm supposed to train my children, how I'm supposed to tra- treat the animals God's given me. I mean, everything, everything comes to center. Might we always be a church that has great thoughts about God? And we are. We are a church that studies God but the challenge is to always be those people at all, new levels all the time. Number two, hope from David as he sang this song to his people approaching God is that we'd be a p- people sensitive to our sin. Uh, it's easy to be sensitive about other people's sin, isn't it? Yeah, it's my spiritual gift to point out sin in everybody else's life. <laughs> I've been in church all my life. It's true, isn't it? You know, there's people that they think, think that's a spiritual gift. You know, that's just what I do. I go from church to church and I point it out. You need to repent. Uh, no, what did David say? Verse 3. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Question 1. Question 2. Who may stand in his holy place? He said, I got two Socratic questions. As you are approaching God to give him praise for the victory he's given you, uh, for us it's this building, what, what, what is our hope? Well, that you would grow in your knowledge of who God is. And number two, that you would grow in your sensitivity to sin. So if you ever th- get to the point in your spiritual walk where you think, well, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of stuff to confess. <laughs> yeah, you do. Just ask the Holy Spirit to show you. In short, forthrightly, he will show you. David says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? That's the hill going up to the tabernacle. I mean, who's qualified to walk up that hill? And then he says, who can ascend to the holy place? Wherever God is, it's a holy place. Remember when Moses appears, uh, or God appears to Moses in a bush that's on fire, uh, but the bush is not being consumed? And God's showing that uh, the, the Israel's in a state of uh, affliction, uh, and it's like their bushes being burned, but they're going to make it because I'm with them. But he tells Moses, he says, hey, uh, take off your shoes. Uh, no sandals here. Why? You're on holy ground. It's kadosh. It's a kadosh. It's holy. It means to be separated from the profane. I can't have your sandals that have walked all over the, the profane dirt, and I can't have you drag that into my presence. Plus, your sandals make you too high in my presence. I mean, that half an inch elevates you too much. You've, you've got to get low to approach me. It's a holy place. So, so David comes along and says, as you approach God, uh, who, can, who can approach him? Well, if he's holy, whipso facto, we must be holy to approach him. So if we look at this from a New Testament perspective, what is David talking about? Well, he's not talking about um, what we would call uh, uh, pos- positional holiness. Positional holiness. He's talking about practical holiness. He says, who can, who has clean hands, who has a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, those are the people that can enter God's presence. He's not talking about positional holiness. Let's go back to Romans for just a minute. We're all born sinners. We come into the world that way. And I've said it before. I'll say it again. Redundancy is a good thing. If you do not believe in sin that's original when man is born, have a child. Did you hear me? You will never have to teach them how to deceive be stingy, all those things. What parent ever has those lessons? None. You spend your whole lifetime trying to fix those things. It comes with a sin nature. 
And so we come this way, we need a savior, and Jesus came down from the glory of heaven, the throne, to be our savior. So when a person comes to know him as savior for, for through his death and resurrection, he gives you his positional holiness. I mean, it's when you get to the gate of heaven on the day he calls you home, and you're a Christian, and St. Peter, if he's standing there and says, why should you come in? You, all you gotta do is say, hey, covered by the blood of Christ. I have his holiness. We know that from, from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.30. Notice what Paul says. But of him, uh, you are in Christ Jesus. And the preposition in, uh, that in uh, Greek means to be in the sphere of something. So if Jesus uh, is the sphere, you're either out of Christ, which is ek, the preposition ek in Greek, or you're in Christ, you're in the sphere. So we are all born outside of Christ. When you are in Christ by faith, what, is, what happens for you? Well, he, he became for you the wisdom from God, he became the righteousness that you never had. He gave you his sanctification, and he redeemed you. He saved you from his wrath. He gave you his sanctification. That's the Greek version of kadosh, holiness. He gave you his holiness because you didn't have it. And so when you stand before God as a, as a, as a, as a saint, you can say it to St. Peter as you walk by the gate, positionally I'm holy because I have the blood of Christ who's made me holy. David's not talking about that. He's talking about practical holiness. That when you move throughout a, a given day with your free will as a Christian, uh, you might do things that are, that are sinful, and you need to confess. So David says, as you think about things you should confess before you come to worship, let me mention four things, he says. A person who comes to God's house of worship should be thinking about their hands. Are they clean or unclean? Translated, have my hands been doing sinful things or holy things? And, and if you're wondering what the answer is, just ask God, show me what my hands have been doing. And the Spirit will whisper in your ear and tell you, uh, here's some things you need to clean up with your hands. He says, when you come to worship, uh, get your hands clean before God. He says, you must have a pure heart, which means a heart that, that uh, is, is not hypocritical, that what comes out of your mouth matches what your heart says. There's no ulterior motives behind how you do things. You roll in truth. Your, your heart's pure. Think about the Pharisees. In Jesus' day, the religious leaders, he castigated them left and right uh, for their hypocrisy. What they would say was not how they would live. In his first sermon in Matthew 5 to 7, uh, he takes them to task over and over again by saying that they have told you this through their traditions, but I say this is truth. See, they, they were not pure in their heart. Their motives were not true. They were always trying to trip him up and to trick him. Uh, he says, is there any idol worship in your life? What is idol worship? Aaron Lutzer, who used to be the, the pastor of a Moody Bible church, uh, years ago wrote a book, and in one of it, the, it had a chapter in it um, about what is idol worship, and here's how he defined it. Idol worship is reducing God Almighty to a manageable form. I try to manage him. I, I can understand him at this level. It's reducing him. Is there anything in your life that you've, you have reduced God down to something you could manage, and now that consumes all of your time? That becomes an idol. And, and David says, when you come to worship the living God, ask God to search your heart to say, God, if I put anything in, in, in place of you. And then he says, uh, what, a, what about your oath taking? When you sign a contract, when you give somebody your word, you follow through on that. That's, could you imagine if you got up tomorrow morning and on Fox News, CNN, NBC, whatever, they make the announcement that you are not going to believe this, but from this day forward, every, every party has agreed to only speak truth no more deception and pure motives. What would happen? I mean, could you imagine? We all know that's not going to happen. He, but he says, could you imagine? May it start with us. So when you come to worship, he says, here's four things to think about as you come to worship. When you walk through those tunnels today and we're coming here going, whoa, this is amazing music. This is unbelievable. I can't believe this. But did you stop and look at yourself and say, but God, what about my, my heart? <laughs> what about me? Am I clean and ready for worship? And the list is not exhaustive by any means, but uh, I would say to you as your shepherd, uh, along the lines of David, uh, what's, what's the hope of the shepherd? That you, that I, would always be people sensitive to sin. Not someone else's sin. Mine first and foremost. Mine. And then we can look at our neighbor. What happens when you're sensitive to sin? Verse 5 tells you. If you're sensitive to sin, he says, uh, he shall, that person who's sensitive, shall receive what? Can you see it? You cannot say you cannot see it today. Um, he'll receive a what? A blessing. A bl Does he tell you what the blessing is? Mm, not really. He, he says, uh, and righteousness from the uh, God of salvation. Righteousness is basically justice. And that might be a, 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 a trip word to tell us. That, that might be the blessing. That God will look at your life where there's been injustice, 
And he'll, he'll give you justice there. But it all starts with you approaching him in the right way. And when you approach him in the right way, he will look down at your life and he says, I'm going to fix that. That's been a problem, but it, it can't get fixed until you get your heart clean. But he does say that he's going to bless you. I don't even know how many times I've been in worship over the years when I've left worship, having entered the right way and left after worship and not just felt blessed, <laughs> just blessed because I knew God showed up there. And it's hard to explain to somebody else, but he, he was there. And you feel just blessed from having just been there in God's presence. Hope number three. But that, that hope is very clear, that we would be sensitive to our sin. Three, hope three, that we'd be a people intently seeking God. This is a great church to pastor because it's full of believers desirous of constantly seeking God. I mean, like a laser lock on on a missile. It's just like I'm locked on him. I'm going to pursue him. You're, you're seeking him. David says, this is, the, this is Jacob. He says to his people, you're like Jacob, the generation of those who seek him, who, who seek your face. Might we be people who seek God's face? What's, go what's going on with our culture? Are they seeking the face of God? I uh, know. Millennials, Generation C, Generation X, I've studied them, talked to them, etc. I can give you the reasons why they're leaving church in droves. Well, you, you all believe in absolute truth. That there's just only one God, and, and we think that's not fair, that, that there's multiple ways uh, to God, and there might be multiple gods. And you say there's only one way of salvation, it's through Jesus, but, but we think there's multiple ways of salvation, and, and, and on and on it goes. We believe the church is full of hypocrites, and we don't want to be a part of hypocrites, and we don't believe the church is inter interested in social change, and we want social change. I mean, I can give you all the reasons, but that, those aren't reasons to not worship God. You know, they're not. They're not. Uh, we need to be a kind of people who intently seek God uh, so that when uh, the younger people come among us, they can say, I, whatever it is that you've got, I want that. You're seeking the living God, and I, I want a part of that. Because when you seek the living God, then all those things come into play. You stop hypocrisy. You love social justice, all those things, because you're seeking the heart of God who wants to fix all those things. Our culture is abandoning God, thinking they're going to find the answers. So they think the politicians are going to fix things, but they cannot. Why? It's a spiritual problem all related to the worship of the living God. David says, as you are the people of God, might you always be known as a church just filled with seeking God. Seeking God. Is that you? A person who seeks God? Notice what Paul wrote in Philippians 3 toward the end of his life. He said this, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Might I walk in the sandals of Christ and carry his cross before my culture and live for him. I just live for one thing, that I might know him. There is no greater thing for a person to say than, God, I live my whole life in hot pursuit of knowing you. I sought you. Might we be the kind of church that will constantly, as we have in the past, be known for seeking God above all things. And hope number four for this place of worship is that we'd be a people who'd want to see the glory of God. That we see the glory of God. Notice what he says there. Lift up. He's, he's speaking as they're walking toward the gates of the, of the tabernacle. He says, lift up your heads, O gates. Uh, be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the king of glory will come in. Who is the king of glory? Well, he's the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Speaking of uh, the Lord of armies, spiritual armies, angels. He says, lift up your heads, O gates. Lift up your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? He's the Lord of hosts, angelic armies. He's the king of glory. You know, there is nothing to fear because Jesus himself said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We live in troubled times, do we not? But who has the answer to troubled times? The church of God. That, those, those, that's where the answers are. When he, when he looks at uh, worshiping God, he says, God, what we need is your glory to show up in a profound way. When we come to worship, we need your glory to show up because God is the God of uh, angelic armies. That's what he talks about here, the Lord of armies. The angelic armies. Uh, there was a man, Gehazi, uh, years ago, associated with Elijah the prophet. They were surrounded by the Syrian soldiers. The Gehazi thought, we're toast. We have no armament. We're surrounded by Syrian soldiers. They're going to eradicate us. Uh, because anytime the Syrians would want to do something, God would tell Elijah what the Syrians were going to do militarily. And he knew all their strategy. And the Syrians couldn't figure this out. Is that they don't have a spy among you. They got God. It, we need to get rid of Elijah. So they surround Elijah to take him out. Gehaz, Gehazi sees all of the Syrian soldiers. His knees are knocking together. He's, he's scared to death. 
And Elijah prays in 2 Kings 6. What does he pray? Elijah prayed and said as he's surrounded, Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the living eternal God, I pray, open Gehazi's eyes that he might see. See what? See your armies in the next dimension that he, he couldn't see. Then the Lord opened uh, the eyes of the young man, Gehazi, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around him. My prayer is that you would never forget the living God. Is that's the same God. We need to be Elijah who says, God, we, we so want you to show up that, that we invite you to show up. Would you show up and show your glory? Think about the times in the Old Testament when God showed up. I'll give you three. Uh, when uh, his, his tabernacle was finished, he descended in a cloud with brightness that blinded everybody. And Moses couldn't even go into the tent. It was so ominous. When they finished the, the priesthood and anointed the priesthood in Leviticus 9, um, uh, God showed up to anoint the priesthood. When Solomon, David's son, uh, built the, the magnificent temple of God after the tabernacle uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, and he dedicated it to the living God, God descended in that cloud bank, shielding man from his, the brilliance of his glory. He showed up in a profound way. All week I've been praying God would be, be the kind of church that you would just show up that you would descend in such a way that we had, there was no doubt from a worshiper here that your glory was here. Bring your glory here. Bring your glory here. Bring your glory to uh, this place so we know beyond a shadow of a doubt you've been among us, and that inspires us. What kind of believers should we be? Uh, David says, hey, when you come to God's house of worship, remember these four things, right? Remember these four things. That, that, that God wants you to know him deeper, better in this place. That he wants you to confess your sin before him, etc. But that last thing is that we be, always want to be a people to, to ask God to show up in our lives in a profound way. You ask him, he will. Might we be that church? Let's pray. God, we, we so desperately pray for ourselves that we would be the kind of people David lists here. And we have many mature Christians among us, but there's much room for improvement in all of our lives. And so we humble ourselves and say, may all the four components listed here be, be found among us in ever-increasing ways because we need to be the light set on the hill that you called us uh, to be uh, as you taught in the book of Matthew. And you've called us to be salt uh, as well uh, to the decaying meat, the decaying society. And, and might our worship in this house be that which builds us up to be the kind of light and the salt that we need to be. We love you. We adore you. We thank you for showing up today in our worship. Uh, and we continue our worship now, remembering just how great you are. Amen.